last time we talked a bit about electromagnetism and spectral relativity, and the main takeaway point there was that nothing moves faster than the speed of light. Um, nothing. If things move faster than the speed of light, then we have problems with causality, and, and uh, well, a lot of stuff doesn't make sense. So that's sort of the main takeaway point from here. And now we're going to move on, and I'm, the next lecture is the lecture on the quantum world. It's the last of the sort of two beginning lectures of laying the groundwork of the sort of the laying the groundwork for everything else we'll talk about in the rest of the series. And uh, well, so I'm going to try to talk about everything about quantum mechanics in 60 minutes. But okay. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is kind of what I did last time, which is I, I, I picked out a few things that I think are particularly interesting and kind of fun, and I'm going to emphasize those. And along the way, hopefully emphasize the important physical points that we're going to need as we, as we move forward. There are a couple of ideas that will show up that will repeat themselves over and over again throughout the rest of this outline, assuming that these lectures stay the same. I, I, I don't have any plans to change anything for now. So, so I want to start sort of where I did last time with a figure from last time. Yes, yeah, still the same figure. Um, we talked a lot of last time about electromagnetic waves. <laughs> And I wanted to emphasize that there's really two things that characterize an electromagnetic wave. Um, one is its wavelength, which is the distance between sort of adjacent crests of the wave. And the other is its intensity. And the first part of this lecture is going to be a lot about sort of the quantum theory of uh, electromagnetic waves and light. And so we're going to be in with sort of the, the quantum side of each of these things, the notion of wavelength and the notion of intensity. Now, there are many experiments that happened in the late 19th century, early 20th century that you probably all know uh, that, that taught us about uh, you know, the, 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 the quantum world. And I wanted to focus on one of them as it pertains to light. And that one is uh, the photoelectric effect. So the photoelectric effect was a, a great mystery on uh, how it works. But the basic idea is not something so mysterious. You have a metal. A metal has a bunch of, you know, a metal has free electrons. That's how you're able to drive a current. You know, put a potential across it. These free electrons move and generate current. And if you shine light on the metal, people observe that electrons are emitted. And the intuition behind that is that the light comes in with some energy, the light hits the electrons, and it knocks some electrons out. OK. So you can, when you think about this process, you can ask, how does that emission depend on the two characteristics that, that can describe the incoming radiation? How does it depend on the intensity of the beam? And how does it depend on the wavelength of the beam? And our naive intuition is that, well, the, it, it should be very dependent on the intensity because our ability to knock electrons out will depend on how much energy is coming in the beam. And maybe it shouldn't depend so much on the wavelength. Why would the electrons care about the wavelength of the incoming light? They should only care about you know, how, intense, how intense the incoming light is, how bright it is. Now, trying to make a measurement like this in a precise way can be kind of tricky. You know, these electrons will go off, there's a lot of noise. If I don't have something to collect them that's very close by, it can be very hard to keep track of them. Uh, but there's a neat experimental apparatus that does it. And, um, well, this, people were performing these experiments, I think, even before Millikan did. But uh, this is, I put the metal here because precise measurements of the photoelectric effect are part of what Robert Millikan won his Nobel Prize for. Um, the other one, the other part, of course, was his famous oil drop experiment. And he did that experiment, uh, this experiment here at, the, at U Chicago. Um, this reminds me, Kimo pointed out something I should have known from last time that I didn't. I talked about the Michelson Morley experiment last time. And many of you may know this, I did not. Uh, Michelson, from that experiment, founded the Department of Physics at this university. <laughs> I should probably know that fact, but you know, postdocs, we run there from place to place sometimes, and we get our history confused, so I didn't know. But he founded the physics department here and was the, uh, also the first American to win a Nobel Prize in physics and receive the Nobel Prize for the work related to Michelson while well, he was here. So Michelson hired Robert Millikan, or brought Robert Millikan along at some point, and uh, Millikan performed these experiments and won a Nobel Prize while he was here, having the long list of the Chicago Nobel laureates. So, um, uh, so how does this experiment work? The idea is you have a metal, you shine it with some light, and some electrons pop off. And you put a plate to collect the electrons. And you just take a wire and you, you know, connect the circuit. And as these, these active electrons come off this plate and land over here, they're going to want to flow back around to where they came from to cancel off the charge that came off here. So you can, in principle, measure a current. And uh, so the more light you shine, the higher this current will be because you're driving electrons around the circle. Um, now, measuring this precisely can be kind of difficult because, well, you know, the, the signal can be small. 
So the way people usually set this up is as a null experiment. And I bring this up because a lot of experiments going on today, the LIGO one I mentioned last week is a null experiment. And what they do is they connect a battery. And the battery exhibits a potential difference that wants to drive the electrons in the opposite direction. And what you measure is not the current in the loop, but you measure how much potential you have to put in the battery in order to stop the current from flowing. So you, you have a dial on the battery, and you dial the battery until the current stops. And at that point, you know how much it takes to keep the electrons from, from flowing around. And that tells you how many electrons are really coming. And the characteristic data looks something like this. If you plot um, that stopping potential you have to induce as a function of frequency, or I like to talk about wavelengths. So I put wavelengths here. So small wavelengths are here. Oops, I think I have it. Yeah, sorry, large wavelengths are here, small wavelengths are here. You'll find that emission stops at a critical value of the wavelength. So there's some wavelength below which, or sorry, above which, or sorry, there's some wavelength, I have this backwards, sorry, it should be the other way. There's some wavelength below which, let me get this slide off. <laughs> there's some wavelength, <laughs> yeah. there's some wavelength beyond which no electrons are emitted. So it means that if I have light of too large a wavelength, I can shine it as brightly as I want, and no electrons are going to come off. I can shine as much energy coming in as I want, and it doesn't matter, the electrons aren't going anywhere. If I decrease the wavelength just a little bit, I can shine the, the light on metal and have the, the and I can shine it very, very dimly, and electrons will pop off. So the ability of electrons to be knocked off is very sensitive to this wavelength. If it's too big, they don't come off no matter how bright the light is. If the wavelength is small, the light can be very dim, but electrons will still come off. And this was a real puzzle at the beginning of the 20th century, because we expect that this should only depend on how bright the light is. Why does it care at all about the wavelength of the light? So this is where Einstein comes in. Einstein, who appeared last lecture, appeared this lecture, will appear many more times when we talk about gravity. And I put the medal here because this is the work, not relativity, that won Einstein his Nobel Prize. And Einstein supposed that electromagnetic waves have the smallest piece in some sense. You can imagine, if you have an electromagnetic wave, and I'm not going to draw all the magnetic fields all the time, I'm just going to draw the electric field going up and down. I can imagine if I have a wave emitter, I can take a dial and I can try to turn the dial down and make the wave less intense and then a little less intense and keep turning it down. So there's less, in some sense, less and less energy um, in the wave that I'm making. And Einstein suggested, based on some, un, you know, so also some observations of Max Planck and so on, I'm not going to go into it. Um, Einstein suggested that this could only continue to a point, that there's sort of a smallest unit, the smallest packet of energy in an electromagnetic wave. And I sort of draw it in this funny way that put a little wave on the finger to emphasize it's kind of like a particle. <coughs> and this smallest piece, which is the smallest, you, know, you can try chopping the wave up into little pieces, it's the smallest piece you can grab onto. The smallest piece, well, in general, is called quantum. And for electromagnetic waves, that smallest piece is a photon. And Einstein said you can explain the photoelectric effect by supposing that the energy of each photon in a wave is determined by its wavelength. Uh, like this. So the energy goes like the inverse of the wavelength. So this constant here is the speed of light that we encountered from last time, and we've had to introduce a new constant of proportionality with some units, and this thing is called the Planck constant related to these uh, observations of black body radiation that motivated Einstein to have this whole story in the first place. So he said, okay, let's suppose the photon energy is determined by its wavelength, and this can explain the photoelectric effect. And why is that? Because he says the wavelength determines the energy of each photon. And the intensity of the beam is just telling us about how many photons there are. Now, if I shine a lot of uh, high intensity beam on the metal, I'm shining many, many, many photons. And Einstein said, well, each electron is going to interact only with one photon at a time. And that individual photon will either have enough energy to kick it out of the metal, or it won't. And the question of whether it has enough energy to kick it out or not doesn't care whether there's you know, 18 million more that also don't have enough energy to kick it out. <laughs> so you can imagine if the wavelength is too large or so the energy of each photon is too small, it doesn't matter how intense the beam is, it doesn't matter how many photons you shine, you're not going to be able to knock any electrons out. 
Excuse me. Yeah, sure. Which is the wavelength, the, the critical wavelength? The critical wavelength depends on sort of the details, the bottom <coughs> energy of the electron in the metal. Or it is not one wavelength. Yeah, it's material dependent. So you could, so the point is there's some, this. so given, good question, thank you. This, given any metal, there's some minimum energy that it would take to knock the electron out of that metal that depends on the structure of that metal. So the critical wavelength will actually differ. But the important thing, this relation, uh, um, uh, E over lambda will not, and you can measure uh, uh, constant in that way. Okay. So in the response to the gentleman that you just gave a minute ago, yeah. the quantum of a, a photon is not fixed. It can be different sizes. Yes. Oh, good, good, good. So, so, so the energy of, so if I have, a, if I have a light wave, and we'll come across this later, of a fixed wavelength, then all the photons in that, if I say that my light wave has a fixed wavelength, then all the photons in that light wave carry the same energy. But, but uh, now I can take that light wave and shine it on a metal, and you can ask, will this light wave eject electrons from the metal? And that's a question that depends on the metal. I know how much energy each photon has, but then I have to know how much energy it takes for an electron to be kicked out. And that will be metal dependent. It depends on the structure of the metal, whether, you know, how much energy it takes to move an electron out. Some metals like to keep electrons more than others. Does that answer the question? Well, the point is that a quantum of light is not a fixed unit. It varies no. depending on what you're hitting. Um, no, the quantum, of light, it, the, the quantum of light depends only on the wavelength of the photon. But you I said can, I can shoot it at a metal. It doesn't. It doesn't. It, you know, the the energy in a photon depends only on its wavelength. But I thought you said that uh, the amount of energy needed to kick off an electron varies with the material that you're hitting. Right. Right. The amount so of then energy, the, yeah. the the minimum amount then varies according to the material. Yeah. And the minimum yes, quantum. Yes. The critical wavelength depends. The critical wavelength that it takes to generate this effect depends on the material. And isn't that what a photon is defined as? No, a photon is the minimum energy in the light wave. The photon is defined independent of this material. The photon is just defined, defined as the sort of minimum quantum of energy in a light wave. Doesn't matter if you're shooting it in a metal, in a wall, in space, it's the minimum quantum of energy in a light wave. Does that, does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought the minimum quantity was determined by the fact that it can knock an electron off the metal. Good, good. So we're, we're, what we're demonstrating with this is the existence of a minimum quantity. Which but differs according to the material that you're hitting. Yeah, yeah. The amount, yeah, the amount of energy, yes. So, so the critical, the, the wavelength that knocks electrons out will depend on the material because the amount of energy that you need. So it's just, it's just, how do I say this? Um, different materials require more different energy to knock the electron out. So if I change the material, it means it will take light of a different wavelength to knock the electron out. By changing the wavelength of the light, I'm changing the energy of the photon. So and there's I just a... want to talk about the energy of the photon. It only depends. The energy of the photon it only depends. So there's two questions. What is the energy of the photon? And then how much energy does it take to eject an electron? So a, a quantum of uh, light then is the amount uh, that is the minimum below which nothing, it will not knock anything off of anything. No. 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 It's, it's just the smallest piece into which you can divide a light wave. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll talk about it later with yeah. you. Thanks. I, good. I quantum think of think light that, uh, uh, this, uh, is higher for the light. light. That you show in there, I know that. <coughs> I assume that in different materials, the electrons will be freer and lower energy That's right. than in another. So you will need less energy to exactly. Yeah, that's 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 along the lines of the Yeah, it's 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 energy dependent. Good. So the two important points to take away from this experiment are that light can exhibit a particle-like behavior if you measure it in the right way, and there's an intrinsic correlation between energy and light scale. You know, the energy of a photon is determined by its wavelength. So throughout all of high energy physics, we always you know we very often talk about high energies and short distances as the same thing. And short distances and high energies is the same thing. Or long distances and low energies is the same thing. Because of this sort of fundamental relation between energy and length scale. And if you'll just, you know, I, this is, you know, I, I just wanted to spend a minute to be very, 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 very much into this because it, it, it really underlies all of the thinking that people use in high energy physics. Now, it's, but we observe the world around us through scattering experiments. So if we want to read a book, well, some light comes from the sun or from something else reflects off the book and comes back to our eye. But our ability to actually tell, like resolve the individual lines on the book, for example, 
um, depends on the wavelength of the light that scatters off of it. In this example, the light comes in has a wavelength that's very long compared to this distance between the, the distance between the lines. So we're not able to really, we're not, you know, it's it's not sensitive to the finer structure of what's actually written in this line. It can't see it because the wavelength is too long. So if we wanted to read the page, we would have to use light of a, of a longer wavelength or of a shorter wavelength. And in that case, it will be varying on the dis on the scale of the distance of the of these lines and allow us it will be sensitive to you know, the difference between this being a line or a line with a W here or something, and we can resolve, resolve the individual words in the page and see that, for example, this is the first paragraph or two of the Hunger Games. It really is. <laughs> you, you, you can check. I, 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 I try to do that. So if we, want to, if we want to probe, say, distances on the atomic scale, we have to use electromagnetic radiation or something that has a wavelength that's short compared to the size of the structures that we want. If we send in something that has too long of a wavelength, it, won't be, it will not be sensitive to the fact that instead of some big blob of stuff, this is a separate nucleus with some particles around it. So, but that means we have to hit it with higher and higher energy. We need higher energy objects, because in order to get a short wavelength, we need higher energy. Similarly, if we want to explore, say, the nuclear structure, this wave wouldn't be good to explore nuclear structure, because it's not moving fast enough on the scale of the size of the nucleus. To explore a nuclear structure, we need a wave that has an even shorter wavelength, such that it oscillates many times over the size of one nucleus. And that requires even higher energy. So I decided for fun, I would just show the in this way of thinking what distance scale the LHC is probing. The LHC is accelerating particles to some that around tera electron volt energies. And if you convert that to distance scales, it's probing physics on the order of 10 to the minus 18 centimeters. And I've hopefully put in the right number of zeros here. Um, very, very tiny distance scales. And just to give an idea of how difficult it is to connect string theory to our real world, um, the naive estimate for the size of strings is 15 orders of magnitude smaller. You would have to put 15 more zeros here. It would run off the projector screen. It's very small. Or build a machine with 15 times as much energy. And we would run into a lot of problems building such a machine. Why is it that the, um, the length has this particular relationship with resolvability. In other words, what is it in your thinking that explains why a long wavelength is insensitive to or what it's really a question about is 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 the is, is, is the wave is a is if you scatter if you take a wave and you scatter it off an object, it's a question of whether that that scattering is can whether that scattering changes if I change structure on this type of thing. Let me, let me explain it in this, in, this, in this picture. If I change some aspect of this atom, if I change some aspect of this atom, let's say instead, let's say instead of a nucleus with a bunch of electrons, I say that there's a, just a big blob of stuff. If I change that, a wave that has a very long wavelength, it's not, when it scatters off of it, it's not going to be markedly different. So if I take a wave of a long wavelength and, and look what happens if it hits this object and it bounces away, um, what I see is not going to be different whether I have a, an atom with some structure like this or just some random blob of stuff. So what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to see this structure. I want to see there's a small nucleus in the middle and stuff on the outside. And in order to do that, I have to have a probe that for which the, the result of the experiment changes if it's not like that. Does, it, does that make sense? I'm, I'm not yeah. saying it's so bad. Yeah, but yeah it, it, it's not some fundamental physics. It's, you know, the fundamental physics is here in relation to energy scales. Um, you know, we always need a probe with a wavelength that's shorter than the structure we're trying to measure. That's just a, a, a you know, a, a fundamental fact of, of, of scattering. But the, the quantum effect is the fact that in order to get probes at that sort of wavelength, we need higher and higher energy. And this is really the challenge of, of, of particle physics, because you want to understand physics at shorter and shorter distance scales. And unfortunately, it requires accelerating particles to unbelievable energies. And you know, this just emphasizes what a challenge that is for, for a particular string theory. And we'll talk about more about string theory, of course, as, as time goes on. I felt I should put this picture in there. Okay. So now let me come back here. We've seen so far that light sometimes behaves like a wave. Sometimes it can behave like a particle. The photoelectric effect can behave like a particle. And this sort of depends on the question that we ask. Photoelectric effect can behave like a particle. If I do a scattering experiment, it will behave like a wave. But now I want to switch gears and think about some of the important features of wave behavior. 
And in particular, I want to argue that you can understand the uncertainty principle um, in some sense with the mechanics of waves. It's, purists will not like this discussion, sorry. I apologize for that, but it's, 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 it's reasonable. And I, I, I think it's reasonable. So let's consider an electromagnetic wave. And I only draw part of it. Anytime I draw a solution to Maxwell's equations, it's an electromagnetic wave. It's existing throughout all space. You know, it's over here, oscillating, here's part of the screen, and keeps going. It has a fixed wavelength. So I can say that I, I know from, from photoelectric effects that a photon in this wave, the smallest piece of it, carries momentum that's determined by the wavelength. I know it is. So I know the energy is equals hc over lambda, and I know that the momentum is like 1 over lambda. I did talk about the momentum of the last particles last time. You can imagine how it goes. Um, but then I can ask a question, well, suppose I want, to, I want to know where is the photon. Well, I have no idea where it is, because this wave exists from all space. I can't say the photon is here or here or anywhere else. I have no idea where it is. So how can I localize a photon? How can I try to take a packet of lights and put it in a box and figure out, say, the photon is there? Well, the, 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 the principle that we use for this is superposition, which is, again, just a general principle of waves. And, well, I put interference here, also part of interference. Suppose I have two waves coming in, and I have from, say, opposite directions, and I take a snapshot, and they're on top of each other. So, you know, say, uh, two waves like this. And if the waves are aligned so that they both go up at the point up at the same time, they both point down at the same time, they point up at the same time, they point down at the same time, then when I put them on top of each other, well, the arrows just add. The net wave that I get from adding these two on top of each other is one that just points up twice as big because the arrow is added. A little bigger. But if I take two waves and add them together, where this one's pointing down and this one's pointing up, and this one's pointing down and this one's pointing up, and so on and so on, then when I add them together, you know, this, this electric field is pointing up, this electric field is pointing down, the net sum of those electric fields is, is zero. It cancels. They completely cancel out, and I have no wave at all. And if the waves are only partially aligned, if, if the peaks aren't perfectly aligned or anti-aligned, I get funny interference patterns. And what that allows me to do is something like, well, okay, first point, waves can cancel one another, and this will be a, using this constantly throughout the rest of the lecture. Um, but this will also allow me to build a wave packet. So I would like to, from some electromagnetic waves, build a configuration like this, because if I have something like this, where it's 0, 0, 0, 0, and then wiggle a little bit, and it becomes 0 again, then I can say for sure my photon is in there, because it's obviously not where it's 0, it's in there. And there's a fancy little theorem from mathematics that says I can build this by adding a bunch of waves of different wavelengths. The idea is that if I, if I choose the, the, the waves that I build together properly and add them together properly, I can make them all cancel out here and all cancel out here, and just not cancel in the middle side. So this is called the Fourier's theorem. Actually, it's a very powerful nice theorem of mathematics. And what it allows me to do is take, my, take, take the idea of a wave that's extended through space and construct a wave that's localized in space, but at the cost of introducing a spread in the wave's wavelength. Now, another way to think about that, and unfortunately it's hard to see on this picture, but another way to think about that is, suppose I wanted to ask what is the wavelength of this thing. You know, it's not a continuous wave, so it's hard to define. But I can imagine, I can imagine trying to calculate the distance between adjacent peaks. So the distance between these two versus the distance between these two. And what you will find is this distance is not constant. It will change. These two are closer together than these two are. And that's reflective of the fact that this doesn't have a definite wavelength its wavelength is, uh, is uncertain in a sense, there's a range. And it's a general property of waves that if you construct a wave packet like this, then the size of the wave packet is, um, the size of the wave packet is related to the spread in wavelength by a relation of this kind. And unfortunately I have to put a 1 over lambda inside the delta instead of lambda. But, um, this had to work out because 1 has, no, has unit, no units at all, so this is units of length, so this had to be something of inverse length. In here. So, yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So, 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 if I want to localize, if I want to localize a wave, I can in space. I can only do that by delocalizing it in wavelength. So, now quantum theory comes along and says that wavelength is the same as momentum. It's it, the wavelength of a wave tells me the momentum of the particles in it. 
So if I have a wave that extends throughout all the space, it has a definite wavelength. All the photons in it have a fixed momentum. I have no idea where they are. If I localize the wave, then I localize the wave in space, but there's a spread in wavelength. Some, of the some, some part of the wave, in some sense, has one wavelength, some part has another. And correspondingly, that means that there's a spread in the momentum of the photons. And it leads to this thing, which is a Heisenberg uncertainty relation, where the spread of the photon, the photon has a spread um, related to the spread in position. So I can't simultaneously localize the photons in space without delocalizing them in a sense of momentum. Any time I have a light wave that's localized, it's comprised of photons whose momentum differ. Now, I put a little note here. It's very small for purpose, for a reason. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle is deeper than this. Um, the way I presented it, I, I'm presenting the light wave as kind of a statistical ensemble. I'm thinking of the light wave as a big classical object made of lots of photons. And what I've said is if you localize the light wave, then in that ensemble there are some photons with high momentum and some photons with low momentum. Okay. This is a deeper statement than that, in the sense that if I even just talk about a single photon, that it extends to a single photon. I can't localize a single photon in space without not knowing its momentum. But for the purposes of the discussion, I think that the, the wave treatment is sufficient. And I think it's kind of cute, the fact that the uncertainty principle comes out just from the simple idea of, of wave mechanics. Um, okay. So what have we done so far? Uh, light waves are composed of many quanta. The light wave has the smallest piece, and it's a, it's a collection of many of that piece. The wave can behave like stream of particles if you measure the right way, because in some sense that's what it is. The energy and momentum of any individual quantum is determined by the wavelength of the wave, and we cannot pin down simultaneously the location of a photon and its momentum. If we know one for sure, we don't know anything about the other. So this is a brief description of how quantum mechanics describes light. And next I want to move on to uh, particles. We've seen that light waves behave like particles. Now, is there a sense in which particles behave like waves? And of course, Loma, the answer is yes. So otherwise, I wouldn't be asking the question. So we'll move on. And so there's many aspects of wave behavior that one can think about. Um, to think about particle, yeah, there's many aspects of wave behavior, and I wanted to focus on one because it's interesting and fun. And that one is diffraction. So we see evidence of diffraction now, at least we would have the door proposed. Um, you know, light coming in under the um, under the door sort of spreads out. If you take if you take waves and fire them at a slit, they'll spread out beyond the slit. So the way you should think of this picture is maybe I have a pool of water. These vertical lines are the crests of a series of waves that I'm generating with a wave generator. So I have waves that are moving towards the screen. I have a I have a barrier in the pool. And there's a little hole in the barrier. The water can sneak through with part of the barrier. And as as you can imagine, after it does that, these circular waves come out. And I can put a detector over here and detect the intensity of the wave. So how much, you know, say how much force is hitting the speed. And this profile that I've drawn here is just saying that while the intensity of the wave in the middle is very high, you know, waves go straight to the middle, and it drops off the further away you move from the slip. So you can imagine doing this with an electric field. That's what this equation refers to. The intensity there is just the, the square of the electric field in the wave. So I wanted to point out an interesting aspect of wave behavior is this dip, this little dip that happens here. Normally, you would expect, you might expect, if you weren't thinking about waves and interference, that a lot of the wave goes to the middle and then it just smoothly dies down as you go further away. But there's this dip and wiggle. And these wiggles continue if you, if you, if you go further up. These wiggles will continue. And this wiggle is representing an interference pattern. What we said before, that waves can cancel each other. In this case, what's happening is, when you have a slip like this, you can imagine that the resulting wave on the other side consists of uh, waves that are emitted by the top of the slit and travel along the green line, and waves that come from the bottom of the slit and travel along the red line. And I've tried to draw these waves here. Now, I drew them here, now the line. You know, the green line is going up when the red line is going down, the red line is going up when the green line is going down. And the reason that happens is because the red wave travels a different distance than the green wave. 
So in some sense, the red, wa yeah, the red wave in this example travels a, sh a longer distance. So the, the red wave you know, is further along than, than the green wave is, but it gets here. When you add these waves together, because they're anti-aligned, they cancel each other out. And that cancellation is what gives rise to this dip. So this is a standard interference pattern. And it's a characteristic behavior of waves. And by a characteristic behavior, I always mean the fact that waves can cancel one another. Got a question? Shoot. Sure. Um, when you say interference, yep. is the uh, effect or the detectable effect canceled? Or are the actual two waves are actually canceling themselves and destroying themselves? The actual two waves are canceling at this point, in the sense that in the sense that the the one wave is going up at the same time the other wave is going down. So yeah, it's but by destruction, what do you mean? The total elimination of the wave? I mean it's not detectable. Good. So I mean if I if I'm standing here and I look at what the water is doing, so if I'm standing here, I'm gonna see the water doing this. Yes. If I'm standing here, I'm gonna see the water doing this. No. But the wave is still there, it's just not detectable. Yeah, well, there's, there's a set, I mean, it, it, we know abstractly that, that this came from the sum of two waves, but if you just ask, what are you seeing here, what are you observing, it's doing nothing. It's just sitting there. There's no energy being deposited on the screen. Is that okay? Okay. Awesome. Good. Thank you. Good question. So, uh, uh, yeah. So this is a classic kind of wave behavior. Now you can ask, what happens if you do the same experiment with electrons? And if I was going to do this properly, I would, uh, I would uh, make the split small. Compared, or, yeah. This should really be over here, but whatever. You know, you know the idea. I have an electron source. I'm shooting electrons. And I imagine that I can shoot one electron at a time. And I have a detector over here, and I can keep track of where the electron lands. And so the first one might go here, and the second one might go here. Third one might go way up here. Fourth one might go here, and then one here, and then one here. And over time, if I follow where the electrons go, I'll build up a distribution like this, complete with these dips. You know, even though I've built it up one at a time, the total distribution of the electrons as I fire them through the screen has these dips, which are characteristic of interference, which tells us that there should be some kind of wave. You know, there's some reason that none of the electrons go here. There's some kind of wave behavior that's, you know, interfering with itself here. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. For now, it's a mystery. Um, the Broly came along and explained this, and he said, well, remember that the momentum of a photon was determined by its wavelength. So what if we suppose that even electrons, if an electron has some momentum, let's associate a wavelength to it. Okay. So every electron of momentum P has a wavelength associated to it in the same way that a photon would. And if we go and do this kind of experiment, you're able to measure, based on where these dips are, you can determine what the wavelength of the electron is, and so you can, you know, you can, you can, you can figure it out and, uh, and see that this kind of principle is working. But there's an ultimate question here. In the case of a photon, we know it was waving. Electromag electromagnetic field, electric field is going up and down and up and down, magnetic field is going up and down and up and down. In the case of an electron, what on, what on Earth is waving? And in order to describe that, I want to think about going back to the experiment with light, but suppose that, you know, trying to mimic as much as we can about the electron experiment. So when we did the experiment with light, you know, we sent in a macroscopic electromagnetic wave, which had many, 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 many photons, and we just looked at the intensity profile. But we could imagine doing the same experiment firing one photon at a time. We know that there are individual plots of light. We know that if we tune down our emitter, we can, at least theoretically, send in one photon at a time. And if we do that, we should get exactly the same thing that we got in the electron case. One will go here, one will go here, one will go here, and so on, and we eventually build up a distribution. Now, what is this intensity profile then? The intensity profile is telling us, if we repeat the experiment of shooting one photon at a time, many, many times, then eventually we'll get many, many photons going here, less going here, and none going here. So from that point of view, the intensity profile is telling us the probability that any individual photon goes here versus here or here. And it's telling us if we shoot the photons one at a time, the probability should be very low that they go here and very high that they go here. So this intensity profile that we measure for a macroscopic wave, if we think about doing the experiment one photon at a time, is really telling us the probability 
that any given photon goes to any given place on the screen. So we should do the same thing for electrons. An electron is no different from this point of view. Uh, shooting an electron one at a time from this perspective is no different than shooting one photon at a time. And it means that this intensity profile should be the square of some wave that's essentially telling us the probability associated to where the electron goes. So yeah, so this intensity profile, it was the square of the electromagnetic wave, and uh, that told us uh, the probability. So in the, case, in the case of a photon, we could take many photons and add them coherently on top of each other to build this macroscopically observable wave. And in the case of an electron, we just can't do that. We're forced to do it one at a time. And that has to do with the Pauli exclusion principle, which I'm not going to talk about. So the answer to what is waving is probability. A classical electromagnetic wave is this. You know, it goes up and down. And we just associate some abstract thing called the wave function to an electron that goes up and down with a wavelength that is determined by its momentum. With a wave, we square the wave to determine its intensity. And that way, we get a positive number. Very important thing about probabilities. They should be positive. Doesn't make sense to, you know, what are the odds that you're rolling on a three on a die? Uh, minus 20%. What does that mean? <laughs> so, so, in positive, so it should be a positive number. This gives us that. We take the electron wave and it gives us a positive number. In fact, each individual photon will have a wave function associated with it. And in some sense, the electromagnetic wave is a coherent sum of many, many, many of those wave functions. I should be careful saying that because the wave functions are totally interpretable. But, yeah. so, but you, get, you get the basic idea. So, but, so what's waving is probability. And because it's a wave, we can get the eyeball interference effect of that structure. So now I want to move on to an experiment that, you know, that the interference in the single slit diffraction experiment wasn't that big. It was a little dip. It wasn't that pronounced. So I want to move on to an experiment where this interference is more pronounced so we can see just how weird a wave interpretation of particle physics is. And that's this famous double slit diffraction experiment. I imagine instead of one big, what I've basically done before, remember I said there's interference between the top and the bottom of the slit. Now I've just moved that interference very far apart. I made two completely separate slits. And if you look at the intensity pattern that, that comes on the screen, you get very sharp ridges like this. And I hope that I, I, I think I have a good. And what happens is, well, the light wave that comes from the top slit comes here. The light wave from the bottom slit comes here. And depending on where you're at on the screen, that will change the distance. Diff you know, that will change where the peak of this wave is relative to the peak of this wave uh, as they come together. So in some regions, these waves will cancel each other. In some regions, they'll be very high, <coughs> cancel, and be very high, and so on and so forth. So I, I dug up a picture. On, uh, on Google of what this looks like from above, just so you can see the, the light, of the, the, the bright spots here are the peaks of the waves. So I fire waves through here, and you see there are these fringes that are very bright. That's where the, the waves coming from the two slits are adding to each other. And there are places where it's dark, which is where the waves from the two slits are canceling each other. Now, if you do the same thing with electrons, you see the same result. But here I really should have the, these two things closer together than the electron wavelength, but okay. Um, you see the same result. If our electrons at the screen, they'll pile up on the screen. Electrons will, many electrons will go here, none will go here. Many will go here, none will go here. Many will go here, none will go here. So if I fire a single electron at the screen, I can say with pretty good probability it's going to go here, 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 and <coughs> never in the dark spots. Never in the dark spots. And that's extremely weird when you think about it. In the case of light, we said the wave from up here is canceling the wave from up here. In the case of an electron, how do we, what does it even mean? It's almost like part of the electron goes through the top slit, part goes to the bottom slit, and then it interferes with itself, which is a completely bizarre thing to talk about. But in some sense, that's what's happening. Now, you should be, when, when I talk about this, part of the electron goes through here, part goes through here, and then it interferes with itself, a natural thing that you can think about at that point is, well, if we want, to, if we want to nail down how this interference is working, why don't I figure out whether it went through this slit or went through this slit? So let me add some detectors here. And the detector, what it will do is if the electron passes through this slit, it clicks and says, OK, it went through this slit. And if it goes through this slit, it clicks and says, OK, it went through this slit. 
And the weirdness of quantum mechanics is as soon as I add these detectors, I change the result of the experiment. The <laughs> I get isn't that, I get that. Uh, if, you, if you haven't seen this before, it's really weird. Probably a lot of you have seen it before. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, if, if, what does this look like? Well, if you'll recognize this. This is what I would expect if I just had the top slit and nothing down here. If I just threw, this looks just like the picture I had before for a single slit experiment. I just have electrons going through the top slit. This is the pattern I expect. A lot of them go in the middle, and there's these little dips from little bit of interference and not much. And if I just have electrons going through the bottom slit, a lot of them go to the middle, and there's these little dips and not much else going on. So, so if I force, so the way people say this is an electron passing through the top slit and, and bottom slit without the detectors can interfere with itself. But if I force the, if I put in the detectors, I force the electron to make up its mind. It has to decide if it's going from here for sure or going from here for sure. And if it's going from here for sure, then I get the pattern I would get from here for sure, and there's no interference with the bottom slit. And if it goes from here for sure, I get the pattern I expect from that, and it doesn't interfere with anything from the top slit. Interpreting this was extremely difficult, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, okay, this electrons passing through different slits do not interfere with each other after we add the detectors. <laughs> so, the way people interpreted this a long time ago um, was in the following way. So, now I'm showing a picture of the screen with the two holes in it, and I'm looking at the profile of the electron probability just after it passes through. So, if I'm looking head on at the screen, and the electrons are going to come through the holes at me, you know, there's a pretty high probability that the electron just came through this slit. There's a pretty high probability it just came through this slit. And the way people resolve this is they said, if you make a measurement, as soon as you do that, the wave function of the electron changes instantaneously. It collapses in such a way that the probability profile is completely peak over one and not over the other. The moral being that your measurement has changed the system. And this is you know, part of the revolution of 20th century physics. Last week we saw that we had to be very careful about the reference frame of each individual observer and what each observer sees. And here we're seeing that the act of measurement can affect the outcome of an experiment and indeed you know, change the state of the system. So we cannot disentangle the observer from what we are observing. Yeah? I think this happens if you just have the possibility of I mean, if I don't, yeah, if I don't make the measurement, then I'm going to see the, the interference fringes. If I don't make the measurement, I'll see the interference fringes. If you have a possibility of measurement, yeah. and you don't make it, you're still see it. No, yeah, I'll see the interference fringes. No, interference fringes will go. No. Oh, you mean if I, act, add, add, if I add the apparatus, but don't actually do it with myself. Yeah, as soon as, you put, as soon as the detectors are there, whether they're switched on or anything, then you don't see the interference. All right. So measurement causes this thing called wave function collapse. And well, now this whole probabilistic interpretation, <coughs> wave function collapse, goes, is, is, people call this the Copenhagen interpretation of the quantum mechanics. Einstein disliked this a lot because wave function collapse means that you're, in some sense, he was afraid that information would be transmitted faster than light, which from last time we learned the problem. You know, this wave function collapses instantaneously throughout all of space time. So this is very it, you could run into problems with causality. So he had a long history of discussions with Niels Bohr about this. And I found some pictures. And I particularly like this one. He's just sort of laid back like, uh, this is this is physics in action. This is, you know, this is theoretical <laughs> physics in action. That's not what it is. The only, the only difference is they're dressed way too, way too nicely. <laughs> if you walk around the EFI today, nobody's wearing a suit or anything like that. Unless, unless there are fundraisers. <laughs> then, yeah, you always know when, when, when people are fundraising because they're coming to the hot <laughs> Okay. So um, I did want to say something about the wave function collapse a little bit um, um, and the act of detection. There's a sense in which we can understand how wave function collapse happens. Um, and to understand that, I drew this funny diagram where now I'm going to be very limited, and this is a very not even proper description of what's going on, but it's, it's, a, it's a cartoon of it. Um, and I'm limited by the fact that I can only draw in two dimensions and a lot of pictures are more of it. Um, so you, this line is sort of coming out of the screen, and this, these axes are, are, are living in the screen. 
And I imagine that this line is the abstract direction in which the waving is happening. So my electron waves coming from the detectors, or coming from the slits, are moving back and forth in this direction. And when, one way to understand what's going on with these detectors is when I make a detection, I kick the wave. But I kick it in some other direction. And this other direction in space represents, in some sense, the quantum state space of the detector. It's all the quantum states in the detector. So this procedure is meant to be a mirror for when I make the measurement, the electron becomes entangled, quantum entangled, with the states of the detector. And similarly, the same thing will happen if I make a measurement here. Um, it also gets kicked in the direction of the quantum state space of this detector. Now, the kicking is more complicated than just moving an arrow, but it gives the same effect. And so you see the waving, so when I recombine the waves, this part of the wave cancels. The part that was you know, doing the original interference canceled. But now I have these new pieces where it's been kicked in the direction of the state space of one detector or another. So when I recombine them, they don't add to zero anymore. And that explains, in some sense, why the interference fringes are destroyed um, when you um, include the detectors in the system. The electron becomes entangled uh, with the detectors. So this is a phenomenon known as decoherence, and it's a topic of even active research today, as I understand it, which gives, it, it basically says that when an electron passes through a slit, it becomes entangled uh, with the detector. And that entanglement means that you know, interference requires that the waves add coherently in some sense, that they're moving up and down in the same direction. And as soon as I kick it in a way where it's waving in some other direction, they don't cancel anymore, and the interference fringe is always. I want to make some emphasis here, and I have to put this here because <coughs> experts will know. Decoherence is not wave function collapse, but it explains why, in some sense, the wave function seems to collapse. It explains why the result of the experiment changes when I add the detectors. The interaction with the environment spoils these quantum cancellations and gives roughly classical behavior. Um, I have to add one other uh, comment. I won't say anything about it because I'm short on time. But um, this is not the whole story of the quantum measurement problem. Um, in particular, this explains why the interference patterns change. But it doesn't explain why when we measure the particles that go through here, it always lands here and not here. So the measure, quantum measurement problem is still, people have different opinions on it. Is wave function collapse really happening? Well, probably not, probably something like this. But, but uh, you know, there are people with the many worlds hypothesis. You know, it's an active area of research to really understand deeply what's happening. And I heard somewhere, I think it goes, it's from Feynman, I'm not totally sure, but I've heard people say that, you know, if someone tells you they really fundamentally understand what's going on in quantum mechanics, they're either ignorant or lying. <laughs> Nobody really knows. But we have mathematics that allows us to model. So that's the end of that section. Um, particles can exhibit wave-like behavior. They exhibit this diffraction behavior. And the takeaway is that waves can cancel each other. And when you think about describing a particle by a wave of probability, that's very weird. Because in some sense, you're saying that the particle passing through one slit is able to cancel the effect of the particle passing through the other slit and affect the results of the experiment. It's very odd behavior, but it is the world that's way it works. Um, particle wavelength is determined by its momentum. And we disturb the system when we make observations. We cannot, you know, anytime we make an observation, we entangle ourselves with the quantum state of the system. And that can affect these subtle interference effects and these are great changes like the change in the interference patterns of the screen. So in the lab, wave particle duality forces us to take a probabilistic view of nature. We were forced to introduce, you know, we needed a wave, and the only thing available to wave was the notion of probability. So nature at its fundamental level is probabilistic. So in the last 10 minutes, I want to talk about taking this lecture, quantum mechanics, and adding relativity to the game. We talked about relativity last time. We talked about quantum mechanics this time. And we're going to end up with quantum field theory, which is the language of particle physics that we'll use for the rest of uh, the series. And I wanted to take a minute uh, to, to mention Sydney. Do people know who Sydney Coleman is? No. OK, some people know. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, he's Sid, Sidney is a Sidney. Unfortunately, he passed away. I think in 2008. Um, he was an alumnus of Illinois Institute of Technology. He. Um, I, I brought him up because I'm, I'm, the way I'm going to talk about um, 
relatively most functional mechanics I first learned from his course. I'm sure it may have been original to him. I don't know if it is or not. But he taught a legendary series of, uh, 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 he gave a legendary course at Harvard for over 30 years. Um, the lecture notes were passed around, copies of them all over the place in the community. People use them for their own courses. You know. I'm surprised that the people I, you know, people I, I meet are like, oh yeah, I have some of these lecture notes. And somebody finally um, wrote up half of them and put them on the internet. So this link will be in the slides. And the slides are posted to the website this year. You can pick it up after the talk. And Harvard did the, the physics world a great service when they took videos of his lectures in the mid-70s. And they're kind of funny to watch because they're black and white. And he's chain smoking throughout every lecture. And it's amazing. He's, he's, he's very, very coordinated because he's writing. He always has a cigarette in one hand and a chocolate in the other hand. He's writing the whole thing. And these days in the university, that would, you know, people would never allow that. But, uh, but it, it, uh, he was one of the great educators. And he had his hand in the work that went to many Nobel Prizes, um, including the one from 2004, uh, Rosewood College, or College of um, OK. So suppose we could trap an electron in a box. I have a box, use a piston, I put an electron in it, and I start moving the piston down, and I, make, I localize the electron closer and closer to a small region of space. And then, and then I release it. Quantum mechanics. When I said about quantum mechanics, I didn't really mention the speed of light. I did when I was talking about light, because light moves at the speed of light. In terms of particles, I didn't mention it. quantum mechanics doesn't care. If I release the particle from the box, I can calculate the probability that I detect it anywhere in this space-time diagram. Now remember from last week, um, something that happens here can affect things in its forward left home, but it can't affect things that happen outside of its forward left home. That corresponds to information moving faster than the speed of light, and it corresponds to loss of causality. But in quantum mechanics, if I calculate the probability that I detect this particle outside of its forward flight cone, the answer is non zero. In general, quantum mechanics will allow you to do anything you want to do, unless you build in, uh, 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 build in the fact that you can't. So, this is a real problem. If I trap the electron in a small box and then I release it, I have a non zero probability to find it out here. That leads to a breakdown of causality, it's an inconsistency with relativity. You know, how do we solve this problem? Well, this is, you know, quantum mechanics has a funny way of getting out of it. If I localize the particle in a box very small, then the uncertainty in the momentum of the particle becomes very large. So there's a very large non-zero probability that this particle has huge momentum. And there's a huge amount of energy in the box. And that huge amount of energy is enough to pop new particles out of the back, out of the vacuum. New particles can just be created from that energy. Well, particle pairs like this. So sometimes one particle comes out of the box. But sometimes when I open the box, to my surprise, Many particles come out. You know, instead of one, I get three or five or six. Or, yeah. And I have to consider all of these possibilities. Now, remember, in quantum mechanics, probabilities can interfere with each other. They can cancel. And the, the, uh, the possibilities from new particles give probabilities that actually cancel the probability I detected before, or I calculated before I thought that they were there, to give a net of zero probability of detection out there. The moral of the story being that when you add relativity, to the game, particle number is no longer conserved, even in a vacuum. And the vacuum is this very exciting place where particles are constantly coming in and out of existence. But you zoom in and look closely at the vacuum, the uncertainty and energy is huge, and particles are popping in and out of existence like crazy. So, if I apply that idea to thinking about the interaction of an electron with a photon, I imagine that electron coming along, and I have a photon, which we now know is a quantum of electromagnetic radiation coming along. They'll interact, we know they do, because an electron carries electric charge, but if I look at this point in space-time and I zoom in closely, I don't know how many particles are here. In particular, I don't know if this is happening or something like this, where the electron creates a, uh, emits a photon and then that photon gets reabsorbed, or something like this, where I get a photon and then a loop of electrons that are on the photon. Many complicated, crazy things can be happening in here, and I don't know which one it is. And in fact, I have to include all of it. Quantum mechanics tells us that we have to sum over all of these possible processes. And these processes get weighted, but they get weighted by something like one of our waves that we talked about earlier. Waves that can cancel each other and have you know, complicated interference effects. So if we want to calculate what's going on here, we have to sum over all of the possibilities. It goes under the phrase sum over histories, and it's due to Richard Feynman. So as an example, um, these diagrams, the diagrams responsible for how an electron interacts with the electromagnetic field, and the simple example of that is how uh, the spin of an electron interacts with the magnetic field of a magnet. 
There's a known classical interaction, but there's a quantum correction. And just to give you an idea, the quantum correction has been computed up to four loop level, and this is the answer. And experiments led by um, Jerry Gabrielson's group at, uh, at Harvard um, produced this kind of result. This is times 10 to the minus 12. So you take this decimal place and move it 12 times over. It's a very small number. And the agreement is incredible. It's, you know, seven, eight, 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 eight significant digits. I mean, it's an incredible agreement. So this is the remarkable success of, of, of quantum field theory, and it earned these guys, you know, the QED, quantum electrodynamics, this quantum theory of photons of light, earned these guys the Nobel Prize. So now I want to close with the following very, very, very casual thing, which is to write down this thing which is called the Lagrangian of QED. I'm not going to say what the Lagrangian is. I'm just going to say this is how we specify a model of particle physics, and what are the basic ingredients? We have to say what the, what the particles are. So we have an electron, that's this. And we have a photon, that's this. We have to say what the charge of the photon is, that's this. And there's one other parameter hiding in here. And that's the mass of the electron. And I wanted to write this down to point out to you that QED works beautifully as a theory of electromagnetism, quantum electromagnetism. And you can put a mass in by hand with no problem. There's no Higgs boson here, no anything. I just write down, you know, electrons coupling to photons, and I throw in a mass. Nobody cares. There's no problem. So why do we hear all this stuff from the LHC that we need the Higgs boson to explain why particles have mass in our world? QED works fine. And that's the subject of the next lecture, which I hope you'll come back and, and listen to, which is why do we need the Higgs boson? So I'll just put up the summary and, uh, and, uh, and stop there. And thanks again for the